Yeah, it was pretty weird to be like growing up and having animated shows referencing, you know, Midnight Cowboy and stuff is with, with yeah. jokes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, Midnight Cowboy is like okay. such a thing to reference in a TV show. It's yeah. like, all right. There is that good pigeons run around. Yeah, yeah my good fe- the good feathers. Good, good feathers. feathers. I want to yeah. poop on Scorsese's head. I, I actually remember that Basically, song. you know what Animaniacs was? It was a moment in history where some really cool old guys reported for community service to be substitute teachers at the local uh, elementary school. That's <laughs> yeah. what it was. Sometimes I think human beings are worse than animals. This is episode 312 of Insert Credit, a weekly talk show featuring a panel of video game experts kept in pecking order through our array of topics by a horrible buzzer. I'm Alex Jaffe, and my favorite Looney Tune is Wile E. Coyote. Mm. Mm. Uh, my name is Frank Spaldi, and, and uh, uh, apparently we've decided that uh, Warner Brothers uh, cartoons characters are Looney Tunes, yeah, was, not the cartoons themselves. Is that, yeah. is that okay? That that's my nomenclature that I'm introducing wow. and canonizing. Mary here. Melodies are the cartoons, and then Looney Tunes are the personality, the personages contained within. Okay, got it. Because I thought they were songs. Uh, so which one was yours? Uh, Wiley Coyote. Interesting. Okay. My name's Frank Cifaldi, and my favorite Looney Tune would be the earlier Bugs Bunny, where he's just kind of a monster. Yellow glove bugs. Uh, well, for like one or two, sure, but not really. Like, like the first like two years where he's just like just like messing with people for absolutely no reason. Be- before Chuck Jones went, oh, he needs to be like relatable. Like someone mm. needs to wrong him first. You know, before that, when he was just like, I'm going to make Elmer Fudd think he's dying. You're talking yeah. Big Chungus, Frank. Uh, sure. Big Chungus, era bugs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Frank Cifaldi's a fan of uh, of the, uh, the, 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 the Pickle Rick era of bugs, as we could <laughs> phrase it for the more modern audiences. You see, there was a time in Looney Tunes history before Bugs Bunny became the wascally wabbit we all know and love, where he was basically Pickle Rick mode 24-7. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Now I want to change my answer. But... <laughs> to what? I don't know. <laughs> Early books. Uh, I'm Jim Rogers, and my favorite Looney Tune is up a, up a Porky Pig, I would say, because I didn't learn how to do that stutter perfectly for nothing. Okay, ah. I, I I did it for a comedic effect because I was watching a YouTube video where the guy who's like the new voice of Porky Pig is like, here's how the stutter works. It's exactly the same every time. And uh, I'm the only one who can do it. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm going to kill this guy. <laughs> and I mean, the only reason it didn't sound perfect just now is because I've been spending a lot of time speaking into large diaphragm condenser microphones, which are the kinds they actually use to record. They would have used a Telefunken U47, I believe, for the old vintage. Uh, 40s and 50s. Frank Sinatra called his U47 my telly. He called it his telly. Uh, I've been using those microphones and I'm just terrified of plosives. So that's yeah. why I didn't do it perfectly with the porky pig. I was uh, biting my lips together as I talked, biting like this. Be a porky pig, right? So no, we're bad. done. Thank you. That's it. Just leave me alone. Also, I think he's funny. Who cares? Leave me alone. <laughs> I got to throw in a weird fun fact people might not know, which is that oh, let's do uh, it. In, in his first couple appearances, he was not voiced by Mel Blanc. He was voiced by an actual person who had a stutter. Oh, oh I rules. thought you were going to say an actual pig. No, not an actual pig. <laughs> like, like they had a guy that who stuttered, and they're like, oh, that's hilarious because we're – it's the 40s and we because think it's things the 40s like 40s and we're all yeah. monsters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I, th- I think they just kind of had to replace him because it's like, oh, we, that's actually upsetting. Can you name a successful cartoon character who uh, doesn't have a little bit of a speech quirk, though? There's not really any. You ever get yeah. up in front of an audience of people intending to quote Tweety but accidentally give Tweety Sylvester's lisp? Yeah. <laughs> like you're standing up in front of like 200, 400 people and you go, I thought I thought I'd put you that. And then you're like, oh, wait, I'm sorry. And then you just immediately wish you were dead. I don't dead. think SpongeBob has any kind of speech impediment. Yeah. Tom mm. Kenny. Yeah, yeah. That's true. But yeah, he's he has got his a, own speech impediment. He has a different yeah. affectation anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, right, I, I guess, guess we got to talk about Brandon's favorite Looney Tune now. <laughs> yeah. He probably I, likes the granny from Sylvester and Tweety. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the one situation where going last isn't great because uh, I got fewer of the hits to choose from. I guess I'll admit 
Th- this is kind of like admitting that you used to be racist and you're better now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I used to like Yosemite Sam quite a bit. Oh, no, he's hilarious. Well, that's good. He's what a right. tarnation. He's he's yeah. funny. I love his tarnation. And, oh, so and, you, and, you like the only guy who doesn't have a speech quirk then. Oh, he's kind of got one. He's, 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 he's rather he's fragging, just, hecking, black and whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, that's a, he's, he's just using period. Uh, he is just using period appropriate uh, profanity. <laughs> yeah. Those are real curse words in the forties. Did you actually know? Uh, everybody probably knows this. Is anybody here a fan of the show Deadwood? Yes. Deadwood. Of, okay, of so yeah. do you? D- does everyone here know that when David Milch, first of all, great last name, uh, originally wrote the first season of Deadwood, he used period appropriate uh, profanity. Nice. Like he like used that. tarnation. Instead of, you know, like he used, he used all period appropriate profanity. And some of the HBO guys said it just kind of sounds like in these these Yosemite screen Sam. tests, it sounds like Ian McShane is just doing a Yosemite Sam impression. <laughs> and nobody would, w- was able to get it out of their head after that yeah. was pointed out. Yeah. And then he was like, fine. And he just starts putting the F word in there. That's too and bad. that's how it turned out. Into well, a- he also made up some things, right? Like, like is Hoople had a thing? Oh, a hoople head is in fact a thing. I have heard. Oh, all right, yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah, I prefer <laughs> to think he made it up, but okay. Yeah, there's yeah. a couple. It's there's a couple. A couple stayed in, but he uh, ended up putting the f word in there and uh, reducing the variance of weird uh, religion related uh, profanities. We used to have a lot of like French style profanity in English. You know, like Sacre Bleu is a uh, blue sac, uh, uh, blue blood, or which is a uh, short for a uh, uh, Sacre Dieu, uh, you know, sacred God. Is it wait in blue blood? What that would be Sangre Blue, uh, yeah. you know, uh, whatever. Holy Blue instead of Holy God, right? We've got a limited time frame here, so I want to get hey, some questions. Our first comes from last week's episode winner, Phil Salvador of the Video Game History Foundation. Phil asks. What is a game you love that under normal circumstances you would not recommend? I think that's most of them. Yeah, most <laughs> of them, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I remember, you know, seeing someone uh, who'd written a book that was called – We I've mentioned this before. This book that's called 1001 Video Games to Play Before, before You, you Die. die. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, first of all, I don't like a god darn book telling me I'm going to die. It really seems like they're putting a gun to my head there, right? It just really seems like the book is instructing me to prepare for my death. Don't put morbidity into something that should just be jocular. My dog's yelling. There's people moving in our building, so he's just yelling at the door if anybody can hear that. I just remember seeing like 1,001 video games you should play before you die, and I was like, all right, you know, I, I, I'll take that bet. You know, I'll cut that deck of cards, right? You kind of just look at a list of like what some of them are, and you're like, uh, you just and then you know you just you, your eyes are scanning down this list and you're just imagining like a, a god darn dilapidated old man you know like you can see every vein in his body just lying on life support he's got hours to live which let's go if i could just <laughs> pick one of these so that this old man this century old man who's never touched a video game could enjoy one before he he, he passes and i'm just like i don't know none of these i don't know man i don't I know why but like Maybe once a month, I think about just like the idea of playing Tetris on my deathbed, and that oh, being yeah. the last thing I do. It's pretty I frequent. Pass from this mortal coil. Yeah, that'd be a thing. Thought. I think uh, the last thing I do on Earth is I'm just going to be high as heck on some kind of hospital drugs. Yeah, dude. I think it's the last thing I'm going to do, and I'm going to be playing the greatest video. Oh, game. then it should be Tetris Effect. Yeah, yeah that's right. Dude. Man, Tetris Effect. Who here's played that Tetris Effect? I played it. I have. I checked it out, and I was just like, "It's it's just Tetris. It is uh, with really nice graphics." Oh right. no, I disagree. Because there's a little the, more. I think there's a there's really good, interesting design that like kind mm. of eases you into flow state. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it actually does a really good job of inducing flow state via Tetris. I think that game's really fascinating design. I think you're wrong. I mean, I don't know. It just, it just, it didn't work on me. I guess I just, I, I, I'm just not like a huge, uh, I'm sure this is the most inflammatory way possible to frame this. I'm just not a huge Tetris guy. Mm. Not only that, I feel, I feel really burned that uh, they didn't use the name suggestion that I gave them, which was 
Tetsuya Mizuguchi's Expensive Tetris. <laughs> I think that would have been a really good name for that game. Like, that's a really good video game name. <laughs> Tetsuya so, Mizuguchi's so to, 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 to Expensive answer the question, Tetris. I, I really, really love some games that are just not good, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So Phil, uh, who's right over the wall, I just screamed his name. You know, I like really bad platforming on the NES. You know, that's I'm right. never going to recommend... Hummer team's take on the Titanic movie as a as a bizarre platform game that makes no sense, but I would play that right now. I love that game. Yeah. You know, I've got a lot of examples like that, and, and like you know, every video game's embarrassing, right? I think we all yeah. acknowledge that. Yeah, to, right? to like, an extent, like, liking any video game is embarrassing. Right? I'm not embarrassed by that anymore. I don't know if myself. I've ever been embarrassed to play video games, but uh, nah, I think it's all right. But definitely, I would say like, but I know what you, you mean. Know, I, I play those Valis games. Uh, I wouldn't recommend them to anybody. They're not right. Yeah, yeah. Like, like you're not gonna give someone Valus and they're like, I get it, unless they already get it. I play Valus three pretty regularly, but I can't beat it. I give this to you on your deathbed, great grandfather, <laughs> <laughs> so that you may leave this life with some faith in the the, the younger generation from thirty years ago. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I don't know. So my my sincere answer here to this question would be I honestly recommend playing a lot of video games i have played and i say this a lot in live streams and in videos and people i think they think the number's a joke but it's no i have played thousands of video games the thing is you don't have to play them all for two hours three hours right yeah so when there's when there's something like i have gotten to a point where i can load up uh, a game on the Mega Drive that I've never played and play it three minutes and be like, I got something, you know? I don't even have to write it down in a notebook. I just I get something out of it. Yeah, there's something interesting to to be found in almost any video game. You, you can, yeah. There are reasons to recommend stuff, but I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't go ahead and and do it for most of them because I I realize that most people aren't like me or you that are yeah. gonna play this thing and be like well that's a fascinating little bit that they got there my sincere answer is thus uh which video game do i really like that i wouldn't necessarily recommend to anyone and here it is cop out answer but it's also very true as anyone who uh, sees what how many video games i play every day could tell you which i guess is literally nobody except my dog my answer is all a lot of them uh, hundreds of them it's just my recommendation. Uh, I wouldn't recommend uh, none of those to anybody, but I would recommend all of them to everybody. I would recommend gain access to tens of thousands of video games that you can play from a comfortable position on your sofa and just go surfing, man. What's the best way to pepper side quests through an RPG? Ooh, I pepper that. One. Liberally. You've got your plot events, and then uh, every once in a while there is a stoppage of sorts. <laughs> And that's where the side quests come in. Maybe all your buddies are hanging out in a hub. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about balance of where to play them and in what frequency. Yeah, I would frequency say and some of the Yakuza games do quite yeah. a good job of that, yeah. where you, you, have, you have a main quest thing, and then they're like, okay, now I got to walk across town and get over there. and But I can do that at my leisure. And there's some side quests that are possible that pop up as I go ac across town. And I think that uh, an example of a game that does that poorly is Yakuza 6, where all the side quests are over by chapter 7 or 8 or something like that. And uh, one that does it pretty well is is um, Yakuza 0. And the so for me, I like when side quests are optional. I always option to do them, but I like when they're optional. And uh, yeah. well, I mean that's the nature of a that's side quest. But I like when they're they are, yeah. when they're uh, rather than optional, I should say like fully elective. Like you really um, feel like you're going and doing them uh, and and getting out there to find this stuff. Uh, but to me, it's actually close to fifty fifty in terms of main quest side quest because I I love. A little side thing, if I like the characters that I'm hanging out with, and if I like the mechanics of the world, then the side quests are opportunities to dive deeper into those and and kind of get more time with the fun characters, get them doing fun, silly things, uh, get deeper into the mechanics. I don't think Demon School is going to be 50-50. I think it's going to be more like, well, well, we'll see what it is. But uh, Content's expensive. 
It is expensive. I, I, uh-huh. but fifty fifty is probably what I would like out of a game that I enjoy. If that makes sense. I have a certain ideal for the balance of side quests in a game, but I've never seen a game actually like get anywhere near it. Oh. Which is, I think, a long RPG should have a ten hour long campaign. Then it should have ten hours of completely optional, like, triple-A, five-star, luxurious side quests. Then it should have ten more hours of three-star, like, kind of okay side quests. And then 20 hours of, of the two-star fetch questy side quests. I think that's what a huge R- RPG should be. Yeah, I don't think anything's done. When you're talking, like, one of these big, massive Witcher 3-sized games, yeah. I feel like you should keep the campaign really punchy. And have it fall into a perfect three-act structure, right? Where at the end of Act 1, there's a nice big hub where it feels spiritually good to do some side quests. Yeah. And then at the end of Act 2, there's another hub where it feels spiritually good to do some side quests where they introduce a bunch of other stuff. Um, That's how I would do it. Um, if I were scoping out a big RPG, I don't think anybody, the Yakuza games have kind of like veered sort of close to that, uh, every once in a while. But I also think the idea, I can only think of the Witcher three as having side quests that feel when I say like five star yeah. side quests, they feel like as like well attentively made as the actual in-game content. Right. I feel like some of the Persona games kind of do that, though it's a different, it's oh, not yeah. the big world hub type of thing, but they side quests where you're increasing your, your relationship with the characters and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Those are, those are kind of close to the, the, yeah. the quality level. It's another CD project red game, but you can make the argument for cyberpunk. Cyberpunk. <laughs> cyberpunk similarly does that. People moving in the hallway, dogs are yelling. So I, I also, I mentioned this on an episode a while back, uh, I love doing the side quests of a Yakuza game at the end of the Yakuza game in the premium adventure mode. And I love to think, because I I recently did a replay of several Yakuza games in in order uh, for no particular reason. And uh, I loved saving as many side quests as I could for the end and then being like, Kiryu's uh, just finished uh, this whole story and now he's... uh, Doing some side quests. No, he's just helping all the citizens. Yeah. yeah, while he waits for the sequel story to start happening, right? And it just, it like really feels, uh, they've built up to a kind of a nice thing with that series. That's your reward for finishing the quest. You get to do the premium adventure. I like to do them whenever, right when I can because I tend to like the side quests better. And so for me, it gives me like a 50, not 50 50, like a 70 30 side quest to, uh, to, Made quest. Main content thing where where I get a bunch of little side quest treats and then I do some main content and then I get a bunch more side quest treats. That's that's kind of how I yeah, do I, it. I think seventy thirty is a pretty good fraction. I could even say seventy five twenty five mm-hmm. for like side quest to main quest. I think main quests have got to be shorter in video games in general. You got to keep them a punchy length. Yeah. You, know? you got to keep them a punchy length. Definitely been struggling with that one myself. What's the difference between a good artist and a good concept artist? Oh. Yeah. Aww. Well, I would say a good artist can do all kinds of things and uh, they can communicate. So when, when I'm like looking for an artist, one of the things that I don't compromise on is color because I feel like if you've got good colors, you can learn all the other stuff. But if you don't use interesting or intelligent or uh, somehow very curious colors, then that's not something that can be taught to you but uh, you can learn how to use blender or whatever so that's uh, i think a good artist knows about colors but that's true across the board and a good concept artist knows how to make something that will inform the rest of the team how to build that in another uh what what, format i guess so uh you can do this in pixels you can do this in 3d um concept artists should be like a stepping stone to in-game art in my opinion rather than like a tone piece which is what a lot of people use it for okay yeah i was about to say like i think of concept art as tone or as like inspiration right um Mm -hmm. like like it's this is the feel that i want Right. Yeah. Um, I think a good concept artist to artist relationship is one where it's like, I don't need you or even want you to to translate what I've drawn here. Literally, I want you to understand the tone and like 
make art your way yeah. that, 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 that fits this, this feeling, uh, that, that I've conveyed here in my way. Um, and, and, you know, the, the difference between the two is very, you know, the, the, the audience intention, right? Like, so the concept artist is trying to inspire further art, right? And, and like a game in game artist is, is basically making, I don't want to use the word utilitarian, but like they're making the assets that the player interacts with. And and that's a very, very different practice. Yeah. Yeah. There are hundreds and hundreds of considerations that must be taken into account when doing the art that actually gets used in the game that do not need to be taken into account when doing concept art. And that doesn't make concept art less of a, uh, a nuanced technique uh, or, or, you know, less of a field. Um, I don't know. Concept art is, uh, it's, it's hard to not make generalizations here, but the concept art is like, it's like jazz, man. And uh, in-game art is, is like... It's like electronic music. You're handed some sheet music and you're uh, told to play this guitar solo while we mm-hmm. record you, right? Uh, it, it's being, uh, you, 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 there's there's more of a direction there. When we think of concept art in Western video games, in the Western world, uh, video games and movies, uh, animation and whatnot, movies are a big one for concept artists. A lot of concept artists in video games are people who also do concept art for films, right? So there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's 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 a, a breed of people who is uh, uh, a concept artist to these elite sort of concept artists. But it's uh, when we think of concept art, uh, we you know we think of just these these really elaborate paintings, right? These like really mm-hmm. impressive looking paintings. But it is important to note. It is very important to note that some of the most famous video game artists, the rock stars, are concept artists. Yoshitaka mm-hmm. Amano and uh, Tetsuya Nomura, the concept artist who became a game designer, right? So it's like the, the art that those guys did, character designs, are a type of, in a way, that's a type of, it's it's kind of a type of concept art. You know, somebody's going to get real mad at hearing that, but it's... Uh, when you think about it, they're not too different. Um, you know, Yoshitaka Amano's co- uh, character designs, they call those character designs, but really, right? I mean, come on. You know, like the guy's a brilliant artist, but are, are those illustrations he did for Final Fantasy actually character designs? Come on, right? right? Yeah. Like, th- th- those characters don't, they don't look anything like that in the video game, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. There's a uh, there's a Kazuko Shibuya. There was like some short documentary on YouTube that was really fun. It was Kazuko Shibuya, who is the uh, the acclaimed uh, pixel artist of the Final Fantasy series. She did all of the pixel art for Final Fantasies one through six. She also redid all the pixel art for the pixel remasters. So anybody hating on the mm-hmm. pixel remasters uh, is uh, not not paying attention to the fact that the original artist did do all that art. Like I don't know. Uh, so it's like it's a really neat thing where she's talking about. She specifically talks about her relationship with Yoshitaka Amano. Did any of you guys see this? No. Nope. It's neat. It's neat. Um, I'll you know look it up. Uh, where she specifically talks about her relationship with Yoshitaka Amano. Where she's like they would send me from the square office to his atelier. Uh, to uh, pick up the week's uh, illustrations, right? And she was like, I would take them and I'd be like, ooh, this is nice. I like this guy. Who's this guy? What's this guy? Uh, what might this thing be? What is? What kind of article of clothing is this? And he would just be like, oh, yeah, man. It's, uh, I don't know. It's pretty cool. Huh? What do you think? And then she would have to make pixel art characters out of all of this that animated and whatnot. And the the real fun joke of that was it took several months for Yoshitaka Amano to realize that the girl coming to pick up the illustrations was the one doing all the pixel art. <laughs> and uh, that's a fun thing to look at. So that's the difference between concept artists and uh, and regular artists. Uh, one more question before we take a break. Uh, what will Link's first line of dialogue be in the live-action Legend of Zelda movie? Uh, who cares? Yeah! <laughs> like, like, uh, yeah, I think, he, I think Frank's got it. Uh, something monosyllabic. He's probably going to wake up. In a bed and be like, oh, I'm so tired. Oh, it's what time is it? Oh, it's early. Something like that. It'd be cool if he doesn't tell. Man, the announcement of there being a live action Zelda. And, you know, maybe it's just uh, age related hypersensitivity to this sort of thing. But sh- that sure was a instant zero to 60 bad take factory. Uh, that particular news. Oh, man. Where do you see takes? Are there still takes somewhere? Twitter, dude. Yeah. Oh. Twitter. <laughs> it's like uh, I open it up. You know, once or twice a day, and I close it 
Uh, it's it's really easy. I have to say, I'm I'm uh I'm halfway on board. Believe it or not, to there being a Zelda movie, a live action Zelda movie, because I actually like the all those Maze Runner movies that that director did. I like all of them. I like those Maze Runner books, all right. I think they're I think they're pretty good. And if you're making like a a YA oriented movie, as I'm sure this will be, this will be like for 13 year olds in Nintendo's mind. Uh, that's a good person to have do it. I hope yeah. that. Well, the, the audience for YA stuff is actually not thirteen year olds. No, it's not. Of course, it's uh, it's it's thirty five year olds. It's now. like twenty nine <laughs> to thirty eight. I think. Is <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. The, the the YA audience. Exactly. It's people that remember being a a, a teen. But um, the young adultification of the entire entertainment industry was complete around like twenty thirteen. I think. They need to get like a uh, a 22-year-old version of today's Tom Hardy who communicates mostly with uh, intelligent grunts and looks. Uh, yeah. Something something like that where you can you can really get a lot from the from the the eyeballs and the and the vocalizations that are non yeah. non uh, textual, I guess. I mean, I think uh, all you're seeing on the internet is uh, fan casts that include like five different you know young white guys Mm -hmm. um which is a bit of a shame because uh i mean it is very funny to say tom holland it's like very funny because he's spider-man and he's nathan drake and if he was link too that would be really funny people are joking about chris pratt it's like it's not as funny that chris pratt is mario and garfield as it is that Tom Holland is Nathan Drake and yeah, Spider-Man. Spider-Man. <laughs> like, that's a little funnier, I think. And if he's also Link, that would be incredibly funny. I think that would be just... And I'm sure that's uh, that's who they're going to go for. Because it's also Sony. Sony is also producing this, this movie, right? Did you see this? Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. That's crazy. It's a Sony Zelda. I hope they can make a PlayStation game out. Yeah, of it. and and Sony's already got Tom Holland <laughs> and uh, in in uh, as Spider Man and Nathan Drake in two of their movies. If they put him in there, man, oh, that's man. gonna be so funny. But also, it should be an Asian guy, and it should not be in English because so much of the lore of a god darn Zelda is 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 Asiatic. Uh, there's Southeast Asia. There's East Asia. There's Northeast Asia. There's all sorts of Asia. There's South Asia in those games, right? There's so much of it. And it's like we have this beautiful opportunity to make a, 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 a you know, a, a billion dollar fantasy franchise that is not Eurocentric and can still make, you know, billions and billions of dollars. I really think they should just pour it all into all Asian people. I really think is what they should do. And it should be make it make it in like I don't know. Just I think it shouldn't be in English. I also think it should be a TV show. I think there's more than enough lore and stuff in there. But you know they want to make a movie, so you know whatever. Yeah. It's gonna be a white guy with a British accent. He's gonna say "Excuse me, princess" at least once in the story, oh, sure. and it's gonna be really funny. Yeah. You know what's a real shame is being on the internet in the year 2023, and when someone mentions there's gonna be a live action Zelda film where Link is probably gonna have dialogue, you instantly get people saying that Link should never talk because of uh this the Philips CDI games, right? And they're citing that as their reason why Link should never talk. <laughs> oh, the Philips CDI games, that that, that didn't work. As yeah. though that were the problem with those games. As as though the problem with the Philips CDI Zelda games was Link talked. Also, uh you know, these people need to just get old enough to remember the god darn Zelda cartoon. Excuse yeah. me, princess. Y- y'all got to remember that. He talked then, and it was mostly fine, right? It was mostly fine. It was better than the Mario stuff. It was mostly fine. Yeah, it was better than, yeah, yeah, it was. It worked out better than Mario. So something that resurfaced because of people are talking about the Zelda cartoon. Uh, I'm going to give my recommendation early. Um, the Ooh. Legend of Beavis on, on YouTube, yeah. where uh, someone took clips from the uh, Zelda cartoon, but dubbed in uh, voices from Beavis and Butthead. It's just, uh, it is a good. remarkable work, I promise. It's that's really good. I have, good. A, I have, I have a, a pitch for who it should be. Who? All right, let's hear okay. it. Uh, Ruby Rose. Oh, as Link. As Link. I think that an androgynous lady would make a, who who uh has some martial arts training would be a really good link i think it would be a good idea to cast an actor though but if we're not doing 
conversation. If Link's not saying stuff, I think Ruby Rose could do great. I've seen too many people saying, Link better not talk. I hope he doesn't talk. You could make it so he doesn't talk. I'm like, Lord, again, as though Chris Pratt talking as Mario were the only problem with the Super Mario movie. I think movie. Link could talk some, but I think Link should talk not very much. I I, I think Ruby Rose yeah, could he, Link, Link can Link can talk. He doesn't have to talk a lot. Uh, he doesn't need to be silent by any measure. Uh, I think we all saw the film John Wick 4, where Keanu Reeves speaks fewer than 300 words of dialogue in three hours, where Donnie Yen has most of the dialogue in the movie. Donnie Yen rules. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can have a person who yeah. is a physical presence. Yeah. But also, can I just say, unironically, that Tom Holland kit's pretty good. If you ever see him in stuff that's not Spider-Man, see him in the Lost City of Z. That kid's good, man. Kid's a real movie star. Hope they find that city. I'm going to be my dad's age someday, and I'm going to see Tom Holland winning an Academy Award or whatever. And we'll be like, oh, I like that kid. That's a good kid. That's going to be me 50 years from now. How about we take a quick break, and then we we'll convene after we've emptied our bladders. <laughs> The following ad supports the Insert Credit podcast, but is not necessarily endorsed by its individual members. This is the Insert Credit Quick Break. I'm Alex Jaffe, and this week's episode of Insert Credit is sponsored by the Video Game Union Newsletter. The Video Game Union Newsletter presents a thoughtful curation of informative topics in the world of labor rights, with sardonic analysis and some well-deserved lambastement of the media executives who hate their own workforce. If you're interested in seeing this historically overworked and underpaid industry made better by unions, subscribe for free at videogameunionnewsletter.substack.com and get bi-monthly breakdowns on strikes, union votes, negotiations, and layoffs delivered straight to your inbox. Solidarity forever! If you'd like to sponsor a future episode of Insert Credit to showcase a project or share a personal message, you can discover our affordable rates and easy onboarding process by contacting me at show at insertcredit.com. If you're crowdfunding, every Kickstarter featured on the ICQB to date has had a 100% success rate. There's never been a better value. Welcome back to Insert Credit. It's time for us to go to the dirt bag. This is the point in every episode where we take a question from one of the patrons at patreon.com slash insert credit whose donations keep the show going and they also uh, get monthly bonus episodes. Even more than monthly bonus episodes at the current mm -hmm. point, we're, we're introducing a bunch of uh, insert credit guide in episodes from Brandon's misadventures in Japan that you might be interested in checking out. Uh, but you also get access to this form that lets you ask your own questions of our panel. Uh, this week's question comes from Jerome, who asks, which real people have had the most legally distinct video game characters based on them? For example, Bruce Lee would get a credit for Fei Long in Super Street Fighter and Liu Kang in Mortal Kombat. And Sylvester Stallone would get credit for Rambo in Revenge of Shinobi. Yeah. Hmm. Legally, okay, so, so, so the question is legally distinct lookalikes? Uh, characters from video games who are clearly based on a real person. Got it, okay. Jackie Chan's got a bunch. Like he was in he was in a lot of fighting games and a lot of platform games because he was very popular in in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, and then he has some games where he is actually in it. But there's a lot of like we need a we need a Jackie Chan guy in this, and then they would put someone like that. But I don't know if he's got the most. So this Bruce is Willis, sort of like I mean. I'm going to throw out an Elvis Presley. I feel like there are a lot of old games with like Elvis impersonators. But those are, yeah, those are caricatures. Does that count? Yeah. Because it, it isn't Elvis. It's like someone playing as Elvis in this game. Like Fei Long in, in Street Fighters, not Bruce Lee. Right, like, but he's basically. We would count that as Bruce Lee, right? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, I don't think there's any argument against this. It is Stallone and or Schwarzenegger. Yeah, like if you just yeah. like, <laughs> you know, limit your main rom set to like 1986 to 1992, you know, like, and just go through the like like 10 percent of those arcade games will have one of those two guys. Yeah, yeah, all your Neo Geo games. Yeah, Bloody Wolf. I think uh, it's probably Stallone. Right. Because like not yeah. only not only is he like a puncher kicker, like he is like your stand in for any like commando or Akari style 
game. I don't know. I think Schwarzenegger is also a stand-in for a lot of those um, with because of Commando, because of Terminator. I think he. Yeah. I think he might. I, it would be hard for me to choose which one would be more, but I feel like box art wise, you get more Schwarzenegger than Stallone. that. I agree with. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a so when you look into the '90s, like the early, like if we think of the early '90s, late '80s, uh, your sort of arcade games where you know big dudes with big guns or you know big dudes punching. It's it's a sort of amalgam of Schwarzenegger and Stallone that did not actually really exist in real life because Schwarzenegger's. Uh, you know, I'm not. I, I'm no bodybuilding expert, but uh, Schwarzenegger's a much bigger looking guy than Stallone. Stallone looks Certainly. leaner. I mean, Stallone's ripped as heck when you see like Rocky one dude is God darn shredded. They're both ripped dudes. Right. But it's, uh, there's this, uh, this type of guy that just never really existed, uh, in the movie. So I feel like does exist in the games. Uh, you know, this like blonde bodybuilder dude, Fabio on the, uh, he, Fabio's not blonde. The box art of Iron Sword. Like a Dolph Lundgren? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, Dolph Lundgren, uh, Dolph Lundgren is like, he's like a real life version of a video game character. So it's like he the is. other direction, right? Yeah. It, it's like the other direction. But it's uh, it's clearly Schwarzenegger Stallone. If you look at, I'm, I'm thinking Contra, right? Yeah, Mercs. Yeah. I'd like to make a suggestion and I'm dropping a picture of him in the chat. Former Nintendo landlord Mario Sigali. <laughs> Mario. Yeah. The names, the, the legendary namesake for Mario. Whether but that's, that's not a bunch of not. different distinct uh, appearances. That's, that's Oh, sure. Mario. You got Mario. You got Luigi. You got Wario. You got Waluigi. You got baby Mario. It's not as many. Et cetera, et cetera. The baby Mario. All of this guy's children. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't look like him. Baby Mario, it baby does. Wario, does, baby does, Waluigi, I, I, baby Luigi. Mario Sagali looks like he could be Mario's dad. I don't know about that. Maybe. I guess. It's sort of the opposite of this question, but uh, I did do the research once and came to a conclusion. Um, actor who has been represented the most in terms of their characters and stuff uh, by a landslide is Harrison Ford. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Between Han Solo and Indiana Jones. Yep. That Patriot Games, the video game, yeah. was fire, bro. I'm just kidding. It Schwarzenegger's it. kind of like right under him. The Fugitive. I, like I said, I know I said landslide, but actually Schwarzenegger's uh, it was, last one I looked was pretty close. But there's probably been a bunch of Star Wars. Frank, I'm about I'm then. about to make a, a good joke. You you can contribute to it. Okay, it's I'm like ready. Frank, did you ever play The Fugitive on SNES? That was real good, wasn't it? There you go. That's my joke. That's it. You just say yeah, you did, yeah. and then we edit it and make it sound like there's really a The Fugitive on SNES. I just rewatched that somewhat recently. Uh, it's pretty good. It is. Uh, I rewatched it pretty recently too as good as heck <laughs> i feel like this is one of those movies where other directors saw it and and thought you know maybe i could make a movie that's two hours long because yeah. this one just moves along at a quick pace like it, it yeah. doesn't feel like two hours and then people made all these ponderous bloated two-hour movies that didn't need ponderous to be trash did you ever watch a u.s marshals the quote the like su pseudo sequel starring a uh, Tommy Lee Jones's character in No Harrison Ford. Uh, it's also I pretty good. I can't remember if I saw it. I probably, I probably did at some point, and then you know, back any in the old any days. kind of a VHS fan, it would behoove them to check that out. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll give it, it a look. Might, you might have a good time with that one. But yeah, so what we're saying, Harrison Ford. Uh, yeah, it's one of those one of those eighties nineties guys. Yeah. I think Harrison Ford counts. Here's a question we had earmarked a while ago for revisitation, and we got some time now. Why is the Streets of Rage pickup noise better than the Pac-Man pickup noise? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just a, a nicer, cleaner wave. It just sounds beautiful. Yuzo Koshiro really sat down and looked at it. It's also the uh, the technology behind it is yeah. it, the, that FM synthesis. You could really do some satisfying sounds with that 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 you couldn't quite with the whatever whatever um, circuitry that Namco was working with was was pretty pretty trebly at the time, and you didn't have a big range of sounds that you could yeah, make. It's a bit it's a bit noisy. I listen to that Streets of Rage. I have the Streets of Rage uh, pickup sound on my soundboard. I, I press it every once in a while, just in the middle of the workday, just to hear it. Um, it's a pleasant sound. I put it on my soundboard. I can tell you that the reason I ended up putting that sound on my soundboard uh, a couple years ago, when I just had the soundboard for like live stream stuff, was Mimsy, uh, uh, my only friend Mimsy, is making a video game about uh, her teenage years. 
and it's about uh, dieting and and nutrition, right? It's just like an aspect of the game, a sort of a life sim RPG, right? And there's parts where her character uh, eats some food, and she recorded a bunch of tentative samples of herself eating food for all no. of these things. Or not, not eating food, but making like food sounds. And I was like, oh, you should replace all those with uh, abstract sounds. And she's like, that's a good idea. And I'm like, I can point out some of the best food eating sounds in video game history. And I played, I, I got the Streets of Rage eating sound. And I was like, listen to this. And I blasted it out those speakers in the house. And she was like, well, when what is this sound for? And I'm like, well, it's when you eat food during the game. And she's like, it kind of sounds like eating food, but it doesn't really sound exactly like eating food. I'm like, I know, but I yeah. get a little hungry when I hear it, right? <laughs> and, and she's like, I don't know if that exactly communicates eating food. And I was like, I feel like I'm back in a corporate office with some uh, some middle management uh, saying no to a great idea. Yeah. But that's how I ended up uh, revisiting that sound and uh, getting obsessed with, with spamming it. As let I let her know that if she keeps uh, actual food eating sounds in, that uh, there's going to be a swath of people what can't I, play I think it. they've been almost entirely replaced by abstract sounds at this okay. point. Good, good. But it was my idea that it just be something more similar to the Pac-Man fruit sound or the Streets of Rage eat sound or even the uh, uh, the Castlevania you know, wall chicken sounds, you know, the, the wall roast. The God, wall Konami roast. had some really good power up pickup sounds. They all sound delicious. I heard your joke, Jaffe, just FYI. <laughs> you weren't supposed to. Just just so that, because people are always like, oh, nobody <laughs> laughed at his joke. And I know you wanted to slip one in so that nobody, so that we they could have another moment. Brandon, you were, you were supposed to let that just lie there. You yep, betrayed well, every me. Every time I yeah, pop into right. the Discord thread about this podcast, the first thing I see is someone going, I noticed no one laughed when Jeff said this. <laughs> That's how I imagine the person talking. No offense it's to you, not you child. for you, it's for them. And then yeah, well, I, uh, I'm like... I just immediately I leave and, and go hang out with the cooler it. people on the Discord. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Well, now that we've acknowledged that bit of uh, <laughs> curtain. <laughs> you know, I've Bobby. never gotten to ask anybody that worked on those Castlevanias whether there was any thought process behind there being a chicken in the wall. Like, did did, did they stop and think, you Ooh. know what, this probably doesn't make sense. Uh, or were they just like, you know, they, they, they got they got these in other games. This is this represents food, so we'll, we'll be able to tell what it is. But we were already using hearts for something else. So, <laughs> I would love to ask those people if they thought about it. I assume that they probably didn't super think about it. But if there's Perhaps like a lore, someday all will be revealed regarding that. I hope so. Uh, stay tuned. I will. I've got another question for you guys. Yesterday. Shane from Necrosoft sent me this Wikipedia article listing the 17 types of games that Buddha would not play. I'm dropping <laughs> it in the chat right now. Uh, oh. Based on this, uh, what games do you think Buddha may or may not enjoy? Oh, Buddha. Uh, let's see. He would not play games on boards with eight or ten rows. Just. Wow. So he wouldn't. He he wouldn't play. Wouldn't play Demon School. So blasted. Yeah, he'd be like, can you play this level of Fire Emblem for me? I, I gotta skip this one. Interesting. Uh, I see playing with someone's ears, eyes, or noses on here, so the opening game from Super Mario 64 is right out. Oh, wow, he, he wouldn't play Mario Kart. No games with toy carts, no, no games, games with toy, toy carts. No games uh -huh. with toy bows. All Nintendo games are gone. Yeah. Uh, no toy uh -huh. windmills made from palm leaves. That's pretty specific. Yeah. Yeah, someone's working on an indie game like that right now. Yeah, no plowing with a toy plow. So farming sims are out. Oh, yeah. So are we trying to figure out what games Buddha wouldn't play or would play? I think play? what we're trying to do is just read this list and make a <laughs> quick comment on each entry on it, I think. Yeah. More or less, yeah. Not quite the best question fodder here, I would say. Like, no offense to who was it who asked? I don't care. Oh, it wasn't. Um, he didn't ask the question. Was it? What, who, who was it? Who, who brought this up? Uh, uh, was, what's the, the, <laughs> it's uh, it's not important. Uh, the modern game of chess had not been invented uh, at the time the list was made. Uh, yeah, eight by eight board though mm, Buddha wouldn't play chess I think Buddha wouldn't play chess because 
he was afraid of losing at chess and uh, yeah buddha wouldn't play chess for the same reason elon musk won't play chess it's too basic for him yeah yeah Yeah. thank god there's no fog of war number five is games of throwing dice i don't take that literally as throwing dice i take that as random numbers numbers, so um i think that's basically every game you what you know back in those days now, by those days, I'm talking about the time Buddha was a living, breathing human person. That's about the same time that uh, uh, Bugs Bunny made his debut. And that's yeah, right. The big really. so, yeah. during the during the Pickle Rick era of Buddha, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, you know, the, the the number zero had uh, just barely been invented. Right, the concept of zero. The concept of infinity was just barely begun to uh, starting to get poked at with a stick. Those fools. And uh, I would say that I do not believe anyone existing on Earth had ever voiced or written down thoughts concerning the idea of true randomness. I do not think that idea had ever occurred to anyone at that point in time. Fun to think about, isn't it? But I think if anybody had a concept of true randomness that they didn't bother putting into words, it might have happened one day while Buddha was smoking something good, I think. He might have thought about it. And that's why it may have occurred to the funky. Buddha. That's why he's the goat, as the kids say. That's why he's the goat because he he thought of what if it was possible to just. That's why he didn't like dice. Is what I'm saying. That's why there are no dice games because he thought there's no dice can be truly random. Is what he uh, he he postulated. There is kind of a lot of random randomness disliking in here. Uh, num- mm-hmm. Number six being dipping the hand with the fingers stretched out in flower water, etc., striking the wet hand on the ground and calling out, "What shall it be?" and guessing what the form of uh-huh. uh, results. It's it's. I guess someone Buddha- make this video game. Yeah, a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. this would be like a great WarioWare ripoff, just like the seventeen forbidden Buddha games. I guess I don't know enough about Buddha because I felt like Buddha would have thought randomness was pretty chill. Yeah, I agree. Be like I, my my head canon Buddha, right? Would just be like, yeah, that's just how it goes. That's yeah. life, man. That's life, baby. As as he's famously quoted as saying. I uh, you know, we don't have time to get into this, and uh, I don't, I don't see this as the, I don't see this as the proper venue for such a discussion. But I so wildly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> with that uh it's uh i i i understand why buddha uh didn't like randomness uh or why he wouldn't play a game that involved this kind of uh randomness uh i i for some but it's it's just a vibe like i said this isn't the venue for talking about it the well, i mean he, is, he, he, the venue he was is into some kind of a sweat lodge psych know? cycles and 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 things having a a rhythm and a meaning to them so i i could see it from that perspective but i also see like you know the whole in, enlightenment bag seems like randomness is is a is a part of it so i'm, I'm i guess i don't yeah. know i'd like to talk about which games most involve guessing a friend's thoughts is that like any high level competitive play yeah no, well it's yeah. it's also the jackbox games yeah it's all the jackbox yeah. games yeah yeah, yeah i mean but it's also it's street fighter it's dota it's yep. lol yeah. it's, it's any uh, game with a meta it's all of those I mean, one would argue that a, a fighting game is more a game of guessing one's opponent's thoughts than it is a game of knowing how to do a show mm-hmm. again, right? Like, right. Uh, yeah, it's in it's in waves of that. Like, there's the mechanical knowledge that you need first, but the application is about uh, is about reading reading the other person. Games of throwing dice. That's I mean, every single JRPG. Yeah. Is, uh, is off the table there. Ball games are off as well. So, like, the almost the whole sports genre is gone. I mean, I don't really think he'd play any games at all. <laughs> so that's what it's looking like. <laughs> that's what it's looking like. I don't see anything here uh, forbidding Tony Hawk's pro skater. Imitating deformities. He wouldn't play Dororo. Well, hang on. So, like, is is skateboarding in real life a game? Um, because number two says the same games played on imaginary boards. One one would argue that uh, being on a well, on a skateboard that's, that's is re number one, Frank. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the eight or ten row games. Yes. Yeah. So it's you can't play eight or ten row games in the sky. Is what consider that means. anything where just existing in a state of doing the thing is a challenge in itself. Like like rolling down a sidewalk on a skateboard. I, I'd consider that a game. 
Yeah. So maybe Tony Hawk is is fine. Yeah. Um, if, blo- if blowing through a leaf pipe is a game, then surely skateboarding is a game. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, what is a skateboard if not a kind of toy cart, though? That's true. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's a good right. point. Uh, well, yes, kind back of to the drawing cart. board. Back to the drawing board. It's time for us to go back to Violence Island. Welcome back. Uh-oh. It's been too long. Uh, this is the segment where I take suggestions for who would win in a fight scenarios from forums.insertcredit.com. We decide once and for all what the answer is, and then we pitch those winners against each other until one person remains at the heap of the pile. Our first match is is Beautiful Joe versus Agent 47 with Diana Burnwood providing comm support remotely. Agent 47 has his pistol, lethal poison, and three coins. Okay. Okay, that's very specific. I don't remember what Beautiful Joe can do. Uh, he can hench in a go-go. Jump, punch, kick. You know what? I don't want to be a hater, but yeah. Beautiful Joe, I mean, game's all right. Guy kind of sucks. Right, sure. he's like a gamer who gets sucked well, into a video game. A- Agent Forty Seven is a killer, and Beautiful Beautiful Joe is, is is not in my estimation. So I think that kind of solves it for Beautiful me. Beautiful Joe's just some kind of good time guy. Well, Forty Seven in just like a battle arena, though. Let's not, you know, he's yeah. not in his native environment. He he doesn't have like disguises. I mean, I guess yeah. he could like disguise himself as the caterer on on Violet well, Island. But he something. he might be able to. He'd he'd be better at hiding behind a rock until Beautiful Joe like poses into existence, um, and then and then uh, wait for the moment to strike. I would say. Yeah, maybe he would disguise himself as. Uh... As like a Violence Island staff, like showing Beautiful Joe to like his trailer where he can get ready for the battle where he's already just poisoned him. So can one win on Violence Island before the match has, you know, like outside of match time? I guess we oh, don't yeah, know I, th- that, I right? think it's like it's like in uh, Hunter Hunter where they're going on the way to the island where where they're going to be tested and it is revealed the test has already begun. I think it's like yeah. that. We're okay with mm-hmm, that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think we think should specific be. specific cases of like subterfuge based characters because uh, if we okay. take that away from them then they have nothing. Yeah, I mean yeah. Uh, it, it is Those sort dead. of uh, metagameologically here a little difficult to throw Agent 47 into the bargain because his whole thing is that he's he arrives into every scene as just a, a member of the crowd. You know, he's just a guy in the crowd and he's he's able to just kind of seamlessly integrate himself. And he always begins a mission kind of dressed appropriately, like uh, like he could just be a guy visiting the opera or he could just be a guy uh, going to an F1 race. I want to make the call that he did not murder every other competitor ahead of time. Just this one. Okay. Yeah. OK, yeah, he could he could only prepare for the preliminary match. Like mm-hmm. there might be a between matches situation. That's true. But I'm, I don't. I want to make the call now that we didn't arrive on Violence Island, and it turns and out he's the only dead. one still alive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think Agent Forty Seven is uh, uh, the star of the best video games in existence. Uh, when we talked uh, uh, recently about which video game studio has the best games and we we decided on like the best streak of good games and we we decided on remedy i think io interactive is pretty close because uh if if one is cool enough to like the kane and lynch games and uh also the hitman games yeah uh i think he's the best he's the star of the the pound for bound uh anyone with any interest at all in game design should play that hitman world of assassination it is a treasure trove of ideas and possibilities and just beautiful experiences however I think the guys, he's he is pretty much made out of creepy paper. That's how you can pronounce crepe <laughs> paper if you want crepe paper. Uh, he's pretty much made out of creepy paper. The guy's going to get killed probably at some point. I'm just saying that up front. The premise of that question was that there were no bad games. So I need to ask, are Freedom Fighters and Mini Ninjas bad games? Yeah, probably not. Okay. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, they could be in the running. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we're all good with Agent 47 winning this one. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our next match is Ristar versus Rayman. Ristar long arms, Rayman no arms. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is this about arms or not is the question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this ain't right. a scene. I so mean, Rayman, he jumps on people, right? He jumps on he things. He punches. To kill. He punches, right? He punches. Yeah. And Ristar 
uh, grabs and headbutts. Rayman's fists are detached and they go pretty far, right? Like they, like he launches them sure, pretty far. Yeah. He can propel them with telekinesis. So there might be a like wrist star like accidentally grabs his fist, which uh, isn't isn't attached to anything, and then you know kind of like a a, a fake right, right, and then he's like, wait, I'm just holding a glove now, and then <laughs> you know Rayman hits him with the left. Something like that could happen. Good. Could be, but with with Ristar having headbutt as a primary attack vector, I think that. And Ristar mostly being head. Mm-hmm. I think that it means Ristar is very... Ristar's whole... Most of Ristar's body is very tough. Yeah. And yeah. so I think getting punched by Rayman would not have as much of an effect as Ristar hitting Rayman. I mean, them. he also has, like, the impossible mass of a star. It's true. Something like that. I yeah, mean, let's, so let's I- make, make no mistake. These are two characters who just kind of suck uh, in terms of just like who cares it's it's like you can't even ask what is this guy supposed to be because the answer is just immediately who cares what this guy is supposed to be he's a guy who jumps across the screen you know, some some cigar chomping cowboy hat wearing guy going here's the character the kids are gonna i don't care just, just get the kids He's one or two ideas better than Wildwood. Yeah. Uh, I think Rist- Ristar is a little better than that, but... Uh... You know what the problem with Ristar is? Is people who like Ristar uh, see fit to, you know, so beleaguered by decades of uh, what they see as a lack of appreciation for Ristar that they, uh, they, they see fit to take dumps on every other 2D side-scroller. Mario sucks. I, have, Sonic I haven't sucks. encountered Bonk this sucks. kind of person. Gex sucks. Yeah. Ristar is the good one. You've never encountered one of these people? No. I've known like four uh, wow. in That's my enough. personal life. I've only known people who like Ristar as like. Uh, uh, practically a Sonic spinoff, you yeah, know, like it's yeah, like, that's true. oh, this is the game that Sonic might have been. That's yeah. interesting. We've heard of Sonic friends. This is a Sonic acquaintance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, anyway, like, uh, I think Ristar won, right? Yeah, Ristar wins. Ristar Who wins. cares? Ristar wins. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Our next Rayman match sucks. is Billy Kane versus Billy Zane. All right. <laughs> Billy Zane, like the real guy. The real guy. Star of uh, the is Phantom. This, is this Phantom. our first non-video game character? Well, Billy Kane is a... I thought it was all video game characters. Fighting game character who kind of sucks. I don't know who this is. Billy Which Zane one? or Billy, Billy Kane? Kane? Or Billy Kane. Zane. Bi- Billy, Billy, Billy Kane Billy is an from... SNK fighting yeah. game character. It's this guy with a big stick. He's got a big yeah. staff. It comes apart, um, and he makes funny vocalizations. He's Any, from uh, the United K. Okay. Yeah, he's a UK boy. He was in both SSX Tricky and Kingdom Hearts, so I think he counts. Billy Zane. Billy yeah. Zane. Yeah, nice. Okay, well, uh, isn't he also in the Phantom 2040 or something? Probably. No, that's based on the Phantom 2040, uh, or, which right, is of uh, course, which is the, based the, on the future. The Phantom. Yeah, not based on the original Phantom. Even the Phantom is a generational hero who. Uh, yeah. You know, he's. Uh, that's true. Passes uh, down the mantle. I still think the Phantom, the original, the Phantom, is the best comic book movie ever. Uh, with with Blade. Uh, uh, a, a number, a close number two. How did Billy Zane say dread, dude. get famous? Anyway, I don't let, even let's, consider let's, Dread let's... a comic book movie. <laughs> I just think that's a good film. That's a science fiction movie. I mean, I think it's <laughs> Billy Kane because he is uh, in fighting games. He knows how to fight, and Billy Zane's just a guy. Can I just say, Billy Kane, as as anybody who's watching this, who is a resident uh, in their childhood of U.S. military installations who uh, attended uh, the Anthony's Pizza pizzerias on, on bases and, and posts uh, where they had a Neo Geo. Um, the, they're going to know what I mean. It's There was just nobody who didn't pick Billy Kane in any game where it was possible to pick Billy Kane because he was the guy with the big old staff. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be Got that guy. He was he was the reach guy. and like People thought for a long time that Dalsim was the best necessarily because yeah. he could reach across the stream. It was Billy Kane in King of Fighters and Donatello in Turtles in Time. If you ever boot up a god darn original Street Fighter, like original, original Street Fighter, and you pick yeah. Dalsim and you just jump, it's like... I mean, fighting games have changed a lot. Well, he's lot not in original in 30 original years. Street, but yeah. yeah original well, two. the original Street Fighter 2, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Come on. Come, Come on. on. Yeah. It, we, we, the original one is... Uh, the, the, we don't even talk about that one. Who cares? This is Violence Island, not Pedantic Peninsula. You, you boot up uh, Pedantic I don't agree pedan- with peninsula. that. <laughs> you, you boot up <laughs> the original is. Street Fighter 2 and you jump as Dalsim. <laughs> he's so slow, dude. It is yeah. like watching a tanker ship like leave a harbor. It's like what? It's like it's insanely slow. It's like I cannot believe 
that game was slow as heck. That's why they cranked the speed up 500% uh, for oh, yeah. you know, two games in the future. So Billy Kane wins. Billy yeah, Kane. Billy Kane wins, but also big asterisk. Uh, if you follow to the very bottom of the page, it says, who cares? <laughs> Also, I think it's really important to point out that uh, Billy Kane is not my lover. <laughs> Just the girl yeah. who claims that I am the one. And it's not right. even Billy Jean either, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, our next match is Sylvando from Dragon Quest Eleven so versus I'm Rouge wrong. the Bat from Sylvando. the latter Sonic games. Sylvando is going to win the star season. Sorry. Yeah. I w- Sylvando rules. I would say Sylvando is one of the coolest game characters that I know. So I, I like that guy. Um, I like that guy a lot. He's like the Majima of Dragon Quest XI. Oh, man. I feel like if Sylvando somehow lost, like, all positive spirit in the world would lose. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. like the stakes are very high for that guy being defeated. I mean, I'm, I'm immediately, uh, immediately pre, pre-inclined against Rouge the Bat having played Sonic Adventure 2 uh, the day of its release as, an, as a full adult. Um, yeah, and uh, those those Rouge and Knuckles missions are if you can defend those missions, please don't get a job at a AAA video game uh, studio in a in a design role. Rouge <laughs> the Bat reminds me of the almost the joke I almost made with the Looney Tunes thing, which was uh, Lola Bunny. I was gonna say Lola Bunny was my oh, favorite Looney yeah. Tune, uh, nice. and it gave me an awakening, etc. But um, uh, R- Ru- the Rouge Rouge the Bat is is basically that kind of a character and not not really for any other not didn't really yeah. exist for many other purposes. I think Rouge the Bat could beat Lola Bunny in a fight. I, I don't know about y'all, Maybe. but Sonic yeah. Adventure 2 marks the moment when I completely checked out of thinking Sonic was cool like at all, right? I don't know if we all have a distinct moment of that. I just remember getting past that demo disc level and then encountering just, you know, up to your eyebrows and trash immediately. And just being like, what is this nonsense? Um, I think it so might have been uh, one or two later for me. Yeah, uh, Shadow I did, the Hedgehog is because I because I didn't Sonic. actually play Sonic Adventure two at the time. Well, they, uh, see, you see, Jaffe seeing Shadow the Hedgehog did, was what, part of what did it for me. Yeah, like seeing that character be introduced, I was just like, haven't we already had an evil Hedgehog? Yeah, who's yeah. actually an echidna who's just misled but becomes a good guy. Yeah. I was willing to hear them out until he appeared on the game box with the Glock. Yeah. Yeah. He's it was a, a good joke. So he could kill Rouge the Bat as well. Rouge oh, yeah. the Bat's got nothing, right? She's got nothing. She can glide. She can she's glide. She, she's, she she makes glide. hearts come out of her mouth somehow. Yeah. I think she and uh, yeah. Silvando would probably hang out. I think they'd be buddies. Yeah. Silvando would beat Rouge, but they'd smoke up after the show. Yeah. They would, yeah. They would, they would smoke like crazy. <laughs> All right, that brings us to our semifinals. We got Agent 47 with his uh, comms and equipment versus Ristar. (laughs) What? It's a weird matchup. uh, Agent 47's made out of creepy paper, basically. (laughs) Yeah. Like, he's going to, I mean, does he have a gun? Yes. He has a pistol 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 of any kind. Yes. I don't know, man. Um, I kind of like Ristar. I kind of like the game. Again, you know, I, I too early in my life knew one of those guys who's Mario sucks, Bonk sucks, Sonic sucks. It's all about Ristar, dude. Like, I, I actually knew it. a guy like that, and I can't get it out of my head. But it's like, I've, like, I've, I've had, you know, emulators or Mr. or whatever, and I've had people, uh, had people over, and you fire up the Mega Drive, and somebody puts on Ristar. You know what game I never played? It's weirdly a very common choice. Whenever you boot up, um, before I had my mister, I had one of those Mega SGs, an analog Mega SG with a flash card. And, you know, we get the 8-bit dough M30 controller and 2.4G. And like, here you go, buddy. Want to play some Genesis games? And here's what happens. People put on Sonic 2, right? Mm-hmm. You play until mm-hmm. Chemical Plant Zone. You pause the game. You turn up the stereo, right? Mm-hmm. That's number one thing that happens. Ten minutes of that. Yeah, that sounds real good through that HDMI audio. Well, what other games could we play? And then you put on uh, you put on Ristar. Somebody ends up putting on Ristar. It's like, you know what game I never really played was Ristar. Okay, right? I, I've seen this a lot. And how far do they get? Stage one? They do not get past, like, like they don't even get past the first stage. Of right, the yeah. They just kind of dink around. Yeah, it. like no, nobody's actually played R- R- Ristar, including the people who loaded up and played Ristar. I'm a psycho and an idiot. I've played 
kind of some of it. I've never beaten it. I've never delved deeply enough. So here's what I'm saying. The people I see plonk around and dink around in it. This is, I'm building my case here. Um, the people I see plonk around and dink around in it, it seems as though the basic controls of the game manage somehow to defy the very narrow set of expectations people have of a 90s platformer. You think of a 90s platformer, you more or less understand what you're getting into when you play it. Until you boot up one like Rocky Rodent, where suddenly you don't, right? And suddenly it's like, oh, this one's weird and different. Even between Sonic and Mario, you feel like you could land anywhere between Sonic and Mario and play the game and just feel good. But Ristar, people don't seem to grasp the micro mechanics of that game at yeah. all when they pick it up. Which is me building the case saying, Ristar is incompetent. He's an idiot. I would argue the opposite, that just as these players don't know how to approach Ristar, Hitman cannot comprehend Ristar. He sees Ristar and just doesn't understand what he is or what he's supposed to be. This is how a star. How do I poison a star? How do I trick a star? Yeah, shoots him with a gun. I don't think he can kill Ristar because Ristar is a star. He's going to absorb it. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's just boring. Ristar dies all the time in the game. Come on. It's yeah, true. He does, he does, he does die a lot. But we don't know what that world's all about. Does he die more than Hitman does? I don't really remember, Like, but like, a, I don't know, like a snail touches him and he screams or something. Yeah, snails. Is that, is that canon? I don't know. It's, I haven't played Plants it that have leaves that are like a little bit too green. Yeah. So I think it's easy to kill Ristar. Okay. Well, so Rist uh, Ristar I also has... think Ristar has no intelligence. I think he's like just kind of instincts. Yeah. Yeah, he's like sub Hello Kitty levels of intelligence. You can hit Ristar four times before he dies and and uh, Hitman only has three bullets as we've yeah, discovered, he... as we've uh, no, established. He has three coins. Three oh. coins, yeah. He has three coins. How many bullets does he have? A lot? The coins he can use to distract. So he throws one coin, Ristar goes to pick it up because Ristar he's a 90s. probably picks up coins, right? That's he's a 90s, true. He is a 90s video game yeah. platform he mascot. Can't resist. He wants to pick up the shinies. All right, that's exactly yeah. what he would do. So he turns his god darn back, and as we know, oh, that's it. his back is just, uh, it looks like he's wearing a, a tube sock yeah. like over his body. He's just got a, a, a unitard and on the there. The front is covered with that that shiny helmet yeah that's it and he Absolutely. just gets shot right in the back of his body sized head all and right then he, it's body time he's dead you know <laughs> that's a hundred percent the trick to defeating any platforming mascot you distract him with the collectible yeah that's, that's how you solve that hitman level canonically <laughs> uh, our next semi-final match is billy kane versus silvando oh Oh, Silvando takes this easy. Silvando's yeah, yeah. got magic. He's yeah. got swords. He's got a. Uh, he's got charm. He's got wit. Uh, he's a. Uh, he's an actor. He's a singer. He's a dancer. He's an entertainer. He's beloved of royalty and commoners alike. Uh, he has ingratiated himself into uh, the homes of kings and queens, emperors mm -hmm. and empresses. Uh, he's nothing to uh, he, like. There's a some god darn fish and chips oi gov kind of uh, guy with a staff is no match for uh, yeah, uh, such a not. man as Silvando. Oh, he's a, he's a true prince. Yeah, he's uh, the real deal. Even if it were just like Silvando's sword versus this guy's <laughs> stick, you know, yeah. we're done. Yeah, even if they had the exact same capabilities. Yeah, which brings us to our final, which is Agent Forty Seven versus Silvando. Right, it was real fun to get Agent Forty Seven into the end here. Um, yeah. Uh, so here's the problem: uh, if this were in some kind of an urban environment, Silvando has so many character traits. He is so well written. His backstory is so well fleshed out. He, his uh, all of his uh, his uh, his avenues are so uh, literarily explored over the duration of the the bounteously generous campaign of Dragon Quest XI. Uh, all of his uh, his his qualities are so well represented that uh, he basically could have a whole hitman level structured around him. Is how well he realized he is. Like he's the kind of guy. Agent 47 could be asked to kill because he has that much of a personality. But we're not in some urban environment. We're not at some festival or, uh, you know, right? We're uh, we're on an island where these two guys just have to fight. And uh, that's not where yeah. Hitman shines. Yeah, that's not Hitman's biggest. Again, guys made a creepy paper. Yeah. So I don't know. 
I feel like Sylvanda would see right through the coin gambit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He'd flip the coin and then Sylvanda would throw a knife at it and just pin it to a tree <laughs> or whatever. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think, no, that's I think it, would end, it would end. It would end up like in a soda machine. <laughs> yeah, lunk right in there, and like yeah. like three sodas would come out and like confetti. A big old delicious beverage. He, he'd toss one to Rouge the Bat, and he'd toss one to Billy Kane. Yeah, <laughs> they'd all crack open a cold one. Billy Zane would be there too. <laughs> oh sure, <laughs> Billy Zane rules. Yeah. Okay, so this is tough. Um, I I I think Silvando survives anything due to his uh, spirit you know yeah. his spirit overcomes anything he's a real contender for our tournament of champions yeah um but 47 has no heart right like he yeah well i mean if you've played uh the, the recent hitman 3 where they get a little bit more into uh 47's uh quote-unquote backstory than uh, okay. one would expect he's got a little Is he more capable of being like i can't kill this guy he's too good um yeah but also not really, but also, uh, I don't know, he gets, uh, I mean, I guess Hitman 3 starts, I don't want to spoil Hitman 3 for anybody. Did you know, by the way, listener, if you purchase Hitman World of Assassination on the Epic Game Store or Steam, you get Hitman 2016, you get Hitman 2 2018, and you get Hitman 3. Uh, you get all of them in one game, all of the missions just beautifully flowing together as one Mondo long campaign. And That's each cool. one of the missions is a beautiful thing. And it frequently goes on sale for around $26 to $29. Uh, definitely, uh, it's the best god darn value. It's like buying a whole franchise for $25 bucks if it's on sale. Uh, definitely get that one. Um, but yeah, toward you know Hitman 3, it's he starts killing people who deserve it, according to his judgment. So he might end up killing, like, us, right, for putting on this tournament. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got that power Okay. to, uh, if he survives. So it's in your best interest for him to lose this one. Uh, I, I think he's got to lose. I think it's Silvando. Yeah, I don't want to die. you got to stack it against him. Yeah. you got to stack it. I, I vote Silvando. Yeah, that's yeah, your winner. I'd, I'd vote for him okay. as well. Get him in there. Wait, Brandon, do you have an opinion? Nope. Then that's our winner. Nope. Silvando goes on to our Tournament of Silvando Champions. Silvando wins, and there's an asterisk that if you scroll to the bottom of the page, it says, yeah. who cares? That, that's the asterisk under all of Violet Island. <laughs> and that's our episode this week. Uh, does anybody have any recommendations? Legend of Beavis on YouTube. Legend of Beavis. I have it, I have it loaded up right now. I'm going to watch it right after we wrap up recording. It's remarkable. Like, you will not be dis – this, this person obviously worked extremely hard on this. And it's 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 pretty remarkable. I have a a funny sort of a recommendation, and then an actual recommendation. the The funny one is if anybody out there has, like me, tried to watch the movie Yakuza Apocalypse on streaming services, Yakuza Apocalypse, uh, yeah, le legally, <laughs> that was coming. Which is a uh, Takashi Miike movie about Yakuza vampires, mm -hmm. and then you have gone to the first obvious place, which was Amazon Prime. And then noted that the sound is, gets to be two minutes off Ooh. from the visuals. Eventually, it that's starts little, thirty. That's... It's thirty seconds off for a while, and then it just gets worse. It's completely unwatchable. And then you've thought, well, where's the next place I could watch that? And then you you try the. Uh, it's also on Hiya uh, from the Roku channel, and there all the subtitles have words that are just chopped in the middle that and and it don't make any sense and so guess where you got to watch it to be <laughs> Tubi is the only place where you can watch it with the subtitles. The return the of Tubi to the insert credit show. <laughs> I just want to say that we mentioned I tried not Tubi to watch last it week. Tubi. I mentioned Tubi <laughs> last week. Um, yeah. There's a there are people out there who you know this who would not mind the the subtitle words being messed up, uh, yeah. especially like the people. Uh, I think a lot of them are people our age who owned a lot of Chinatown VCDs in the yeah. in the nineties and early two thousands uh, of, of kung fu movies and whatnot. Uh, who owned a you know a DVD of Iron Monkey, uh, a bootleg. Um, uh, but there's there's people out there who just wouldn't mind that yeah. first one, and that that blows my mind. That makes me feel like yeah, ripping my own head off to think of people who. That's 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 almost as bad as watching something with the motion smoothing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then my uh, real recommendation is the the 
most Dreamcast game of 2022, Saturnalia, which I mentioned uh, during our games of the year for the last one, that is now out on Steam as of last couple days. And so if you want to play a game that is like uh, Ill Bleed plus D2 set in a a giallo kind of Italian horror universe, that's that's probably the one that you, if you, if you have those very specific interests, this is the the game that you can play, and it's now on Steam. So it's, it's already been on a whole lot of other stuff, but it's on out on Steam now. So check it out. Steam. Tim, you want to recommend Dragon Quest Eleven? I've already made enough money for those god darn people. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, you know, I don't want to overstate my my influence, but apparently it was a lot. It's impossible to tell. Um, I will say. Um, that if anyone out there is interested in this, this is actually something that might interest um, a lot of people here. It's a video game related thing, so it doesn't really count as like a general recommendation. Though uh, fans of uh, the work of uh, Toshihiro Nagoshi, the maker of uh, Super Monkey Ball and F Zero GX, mm-hmm. um, you know, and uh, Sega Rally and uh, Daytona USA, might be pleased to know that just yesterday, as per the time of this recording, just yesterday, M Two. Um, the, the, the Sega released um, an M2 port of Daytona USA 2. Ooh. It was never been released for a home console ever. And it's now available on Steam, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X. You got Daytona USA 2 for the first time playable in perfect fidelity on a, on a home console legally purchasable from Sega. Unfortunately, it costs $49.99 and the menu is an entire video game about Kazuma Kiryu, and it's called uh, Yakuza <laughs> Like a Dragon Gaiden, the man who erased his name. But <laughs> nice, that is out there, and uh, it, it's now uh, we're going to be uh, probably seeing it. You're probably not going to be able to throw a god darn like medium sized cinder block fragment in uh, you know any small town DMV without hitting someone who was in the middle of a conversation about how they'd always thought Daytona USA 2 was better than the original, right? Like, uh, it, it's going to happen, and it's going to become unbearable everywhere in the world. And no one's going to be talking about anything else. Uh, but uh, people, you're going to be seeing a lot of your friends, loved ones. I know Thanksgiving's around the corner. You're going to sit down, and your uncle's going to go, you know, I've always thought that Daytona USA 2 was better than Sega Rally. You're going to be hearing people just bringing out <laughs> these unhinged opinions. Um, and I want you to get ahead of it and know... Daytona USA 2 is incredible if you've never played it. Um, it is it is a wonderful, wonderful video game. And now you can play it on any home console. You just have to be pretty entrenched in the Yakuza series in order yeah. to, uh, to be able to... Uh, if it's worth $49.99 to you, you do have to sit through a bit of an intro involving many characters you might have never heard of or seen if you've never played a Yakuza game. But you can probably do it. Daytona <laughs> USA 2, baby. It's That's here. a great recommendation. It's here. Tim, do you check this out? This is why I stood up. Um, there's, there's a, there was a Daytona yeah. USA anniversary CD box set, which has the soundtrack of Daytona 2 on it, among many others. It's four discs That's of too much heck. Daytona. Also, if anybody listening to this is located in the Indianapolis, Indiana metro area, Boss Battle Games at Castleton Square Mall is one of the few places in the entire world that has perfect, beautiful, vintage, uh, ultra-high quality, eight-linked Daytona USA cabinets. Um, You might try to bring up some Dave & Buster's or round one in your neighborhood, dear listener, but no, Dank got nothing on this. Yeah, there's only four connected at the round one in Concord. I will say also, I, I to my knowledge, Boss Battle Games and Castleton Square Mall in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, who is not paying for a sponsorship here, uh, I think they are the only place in the entire world where you can play four-player F-Zero GX Deluxe. They have four linked deluxe cabinets. So any Sega racing fans, if you get you if you get that Daytona USA two and you, you want some more, you want to see where did where did these guys go next with the uh, racing games? Uh, check out uh, 
you know, check out that F Zero GX in that particular arcade. I have some specific recommendations myself uh, for the first time in a while. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Aftermath. Uh, our friend Tagita Jackson and our acquaintances Nathan Grayson, Riley McLeod, and Luke Plunkett just started a worker-owned, reader-supported news site covering video games and culture. And it's also the home of my brand new podcast. It's called 52 Pickup, and it's focused centrally on a DC comic book series that came out in 2006 that Gita Jackson and I both fell in love with at the time and kind of lost our minds reading. And we go deep into it every episode and talk about how it reflects kind of the way we think about comic book universes today. It's something I'm immensely proud of, and I hope you give it a try, whether you care about comic books or not. Um, Also, if you've enjoyed this episode or any episode of Insert Credit, please rate and review our show wherever and however you can. I read all those reviews and I love them to bits. You could also support us on patreon.com slash insert credit, where you could become a patron to submit your own questions, listen to monthly bonus episodes, and help pay my rent. If you'd like to sponsor our show with an advertisement or personal message, uh, you could do that by contacting us at show at insertcredit.com. You could also join our community at forums.insertcredit.com or find videos of these episodes on youtube.com slash insertcreditshow. Please wishlist the assuredly side quest heavy demon school on Steam. And here's a tip from me. If you donate to the Video Game History Foundation at GameHistory.org right now, you'll be contributing to a very cool secret thing that Frank is working on. Uh, This episode is edited by Esper Quinn, with original music by Kurt Feldman. I'm Alex Jaffe. I'm Frank Cifaldi. I'm Tim Rogers. I'm Brandon Sheffield. And we'll see you next time on Pedantic Peninsula. Uh, well, I have to eat lunch. Let's go away.